This is Splice. This is Splice Pink. We're Alan and Rishad, and this is a little podcast where we talk to fantastic people in the media community that we're so proud of. Today, we're speaking with Byron Perry, the founder and CEO of Coconuts, which recently celebrated its 10th anniversary. The publisher covers Bangkok, Manila, Singapore, Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, Bali, Yangon, all the strange, crazy things happening in these cities. So, Byron, we've known you for for a long time now, back when you were just a two-city guide. Um, what's the best way to define uh, what Coconuts is today, 10 years in? Is it, a, is it still a city guide? Is it a documentary producer, creative studio, a meme tastemaker? What, what's the best way in which you describe the company now? It's all those things except a meme tastemaker. Did you say meme <laughs> tastemaker? Yeah. That's we right. don't do much memes as much as memes are awesome and maybe we should do more memes. But everything you just said, we are some of that um, we're definitely still a city website network covering those eight cities that you mentioned. Um, the biggest cities, or I would say our biggest audience is in Singapore and Bangkok these days, but Hong Kong, Manila, Jakarta, not far behind. And so we cover those stories with written articles. And then we have Coconuts TV, which is our um, documentary and factual video production house working on um, a docu-series right now, true crime docu-series actually in Thailand that we're going to look to aim to sell to um, a big streamer potentially. And then we do have an in-house creative agency, which is called Grove, where we work with brands like Ferrero or Hilton or Grab, oftentimes producing content, running um, advertising campaigns on our publications. And we are more of a... um, we have multiple publications under our um, brand these days. And so we bought BK Magazine last year, the leading food and lifestyle magazine in Bangkok. It's been around for 20 years. So we're more than just coconuts. We have a few publications. We have three publications, actually, to be exact. Um, Soy Milk is the other publication we bought, which is a Thai language uh, publication for what to do, where to go for young people in Bangkok. So we're kind of becoming more of a publishing house, too. Do you remember the moment, Byron, that made you go, coconuts is a thing I absolutely have to do right now? I had had the idea in my mind for a long time. Well, since I moved to Asia to have a local city blog called Coconuts. And I actually did collect the writing that I did when I worked at the Phnom Penh Post in Siem Reap, Cambodia on a little blog called Coconuts. So at that point, it was kind of just for fun and the name, you know, I, I like the name and the brand. I then went and did a few other jobs in Asia, including working for Property Report Southeast Asia, which ended up getting acquired by Property Guru. And then I launched Coconuts in Bangkok about two years later after launching a blog called Coconuts just as a fun project in Cambodia. So I always liked the name Coconuts. I always wanted to be writing about things happening in the places that I was and, um, it did take off pretty quickly in Bangkok. So that's probably when I was like, wow, this is something that I could really kind of pursue. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the origin story. And I launched it in Bangkok. It was just me at the very beginning. I wrote everything myself. I had the site built and you know, d- did all the management of the CMS and the social media, which I pretty much do very little of that now, but it was great training and great experience to know from the very beginning, everything that goes into putting out a publication. So the, I, I think it's really awesome that you you started this wanting to write, and then now you yeah. built this into a, a much bigger business. And you've, you know, you've made it past the 10-year mark. Um, what, when, when you look back at, at that journey uh, as you, as, as an entrepreneur, you know, how do you, how do you think about that? Because as you said, you, you like getting into the weeds of building it, putting it together. And then where, where are you now? What, what do you do now, 10 years in? So right now, um, as the CEO, I am pretty hands off, frankly, which is great, especially because I'm on paternity leave. So I have some key people who are managing the business for me and it's going really well so far. You're absolutely right, though, that at the beginning and at the end of the day, I'm a journalist and I'm a writer and I'm a storyteller. And I feel like that's what you need in the DNA of a media organization to be successful. Um, That's what everything branches off from in terms of um, your audience and how you make money, et cetera. So these days, yeah, we we now have 50 staff. Um, We gain quite a few staff 
uh, from the acquisition of BK Magazine and Soy Milk in Thailand. We have three publications. We have our main departments are editorial, which is the writers and the journalists for those three publications. Grove, which I mentioned earlier, which is our in-house agency, which does all the sales and the campaign management of um, campaigns on our publications or increasingly creative services for brands that don't appear on our publications. And then Coconuts TV, which is our video production house. So each one of those departments has a leader that I can really delegate a lot to, and they manage those departments and they interact with each other really well. So yeah, I, I these days really more so just lead strategy, uh, oversee, again, the leaders of those departments and advise them on anything they need help with. I think more and more I'm thinking about, and we have done a lot of good work in the last year about when you get bigger as an organization, your company culture and what principles you put in place with me not being able to be there all the time or you know, my right-hand person not being able to be there all the time. So as we get bigger, it's more about that than it is about me doing everything. you know. And I think that's sort of the phase that we're in. I'm curious about what you know now about your audience that you didn't back then. And I'm also curious about who this core Coconuts user is. Who are they? So yeah, on Coconuts alone, coconuts.co right now, we're getting about 1.5 to 2 million users. It's actually been that way for a while. Um, and then with BK and Soy Milk, we're getting anywhere, in addition to the 1.5 to 2 million on Coconuts, like another million. Um, our demographics on Coconuts specifically, what we like to define them as and what I think they are is um, young, professional, employed, generally higher income, frequent traveling, pre-pandemic people in these eight cities that we cover, but with Singapore, Bangkok, Hong Kong, Manila, and Jakarta probably being the biggest. Um, we also have a decent segment from the U.S. I think about 10% of our traffic is from the U.S., so we have a little slice of the audience from there. Um, but yeah, I think the audience... I feel like our audience hasn't changed that much. What's changed more so is how they come to us. Because some of the biggest changes I've seen in our acquisition of users is that Facebook has decreased heavily, as it has with most publishers. Google search has actually increased quite a lot. Direct, direct tr traffic has increased a lot, a lot of it coming directly to URLs. So we think that that's dark social traffic, people sharing our stories in chat groups directly with each other on text or WhatsApp or line. Um, so I think like the demographic, the demographics of our audience haven't changed that much, but how they get to coconuts has, has changed a lot over the last 10 years. I'm, I'm interested in that because you have so many products or you've done so much over the past 10 years, right? Everything from, from text formats to video to OTT. How how do I how are you looking at, at these audiences and what what is that overlap? How how does someone who starts discovering you on on say you know uh, on one of the OTT platforms on Netflix for example find their way to you on the website and and what is your preference for that user in terms of intention? Yeah, great question. At our core, we're still a written article website and a website. You know. So our most important platform is our owned platform of the coconuts.co website. And then in the case of BK, the BK website and the printed magazine. We're increasingly less excited about a social audience, you know, and like so many publishers, we've gotten burned by social platforms when we have a big audience on any social platform. So that's been a big drive over the last few years. It's not something that's happened recently. It's been two, three years we've been pushing to really emphasize our website, and, and it's gone well. Um, we've also tried to grow our newsletters, um, you know, which is really a great direct way to reach people and have them consume your content, which is also going well. But yeah, I think for us, it's really about emphasizing that own platform and not as much worrying about the audience on non-owned platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Um, and those audience have obviously fluctuated. Their engagement has fluctuated. But the 
traffic to our website has remained steady and, and solid. So that's what we care about most. And in terms of all these platforms, when it comes to monetization, where are you able to extract the most revenue per user? Same thing on our website. And that's why, you know, the social platforms are really an offshoot that would be involved in any campaigns. And it is definitely true that a lot of clients, advertising clients, of course, care a lot about the social aspect of their campaign. But I frankly really try to push our team to to coach them to care less about that. And I think it's a genuinely true um, and good strategy that they they care less about when they're buying a campaign with coconuts, what happens on social media. Because if they want to get Facebook likes, if they want Facebook engagement, frankly, they should just do that directly on their own pages or pay for it as well, which is something that we as most publishers do oftentimes boost the content to make sure that it achieves what we wanted. Whereas the true unique selling point that we have is our platform. And so they can do whatever they want. They don't need us to get Facebook engagement, to get Facebook likes, but they can only access the Coconuts website audience through us. And so we do really push clients to realize that. And more and more, I think they are uh, realizing that and go for that. I'm curious about how you plan uh, fundraising. So we haven't raised money in quite a little while. And this year we should be profitable, which would be for the first time ever. It should be great. We did secure some financing to acquire BK, but it wasn't really your typical um, funding round, whether that was debt or equity. It was really specific financing to acquire this asset. So frankly, in the last few years, I've been focused more on sustainability, profitability. There was some securing of financing to buy BK Magazine than any sort of fundraising strategy, really. And, and really, it seems like this year it's happening which is very exciting. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about BK. I actually had that yeah. as a as a question for much later on, but I'm you know, you brought this up a few yeah. times now. So let's let's get into it. What what value did BK add to you as a business? Well, very simply, BK has a lot of clients and a lot of revenue in Thailand. They're long-standing there, they're the lifestyle and especially food and drink bible of Bangkok, and that's something I kind of knew, but when I was pursuing the acquisition and spoke to many people, I learned that more and more that like yeah, it was just first thing everybody says was BK is where I go to uh, figure out where I'm going to go eat, you know, and they're the Bible for Bangkok's vibrant restaurant scene, which unfortunately has really taken a hit due to the pandemic. But um, yeah, very simply, we saw we're adding a publication to our portfolio that has a great slate of um, clients that are going to continue on with us. Uh, we're adding a new uh, medium, which is print, which is very exciting. So we can sell a campaign across Coconuts and BK that has digital on both websites and then a print aspect on BK. And I think it's really just the beginning, I hope, of potentially adding more publications to our stable. Because I think really that's something we will be seeing more of in the digital media space is consolidating. And um, that was kind of a bit of a consolidation move because really they were our biggest um, competitor in Thailand. It was always BK and Coconuts in advertising client meetings, not as much for readers because we're actually quite bigger than them in terms of readership, but for clients and for advertising. So apart from advertising, um, have you considered revenue products, reader revenue product? Yeah. So we did launch um, the Coco Plus membership program in 2018. And um, it's gone not so great, frankly. It's gone just okay. And so what happened was, um, I can kind of tell you the, the, the saga of Coco Plus, which is still ongoing. And I, I, I absolutely love reader revenue. I think that it's such a key third revenue stream for publications because, you know, there's sort of advertising, potentially content production and licensing, and then reader revenue. And I think it's really challenging these days in digital media, and you may need three revenue streams to make it. Um, so we launched Coco Plus, and uh, we implemented a paywall on Coconuts. We also had other benefits to the membership program, including, of course, a tote bag, um, discounts, events. Uh, and we had some great events with great speakers across Singapore, Bangkok, et cetera. But I think there were a few key problems. Um, one, you know, our journalism, our content does not lend itself to a paywall. We're known as being funny, 
silly, covering crazy viral stuff. We're lesser known for doing impactful original journalism, which we do do all the time, but it just doesn't go viral. But we are known for, you know, funny, silly viral stuff. And that type of stuff behind a paywall doesn't work. So we did experiment with the paywall a lot. And we were very actually kind of transparent about that with our audience. We would say, you know, we're figuring out what works best in terms of whether it's um, a metered paywall or freemium. We did it all. Um, But what we found, which was very interesting, and maybe you guys have come across other publishers who have found this, that there were really only two things that moved the needle in terms of driving subscriptions. One was being really aggressive with the paywall, which again, we didn't like. Not only did our audience not like it, but our journalists didn't like it. One thing we would do, for example, is heavily promote a showcase original feature that was paywalled. So we found that worked well. And then number two was Facebook advertising. Um, That was quite aggressive. And that I think I didn't really feel super comfortable with. I don't think our audience liked it because, you know, it was very targeted. So the same people see the ads over and over. It's a paywalled piece of content. So those were the two things we found do pretty well drive subscriptions. Again, didn't love that fact. And then the pandemic hit. And so when the pandemic hit around March 2020, we were actually already at an inflection point where I was kind of saying either we need to take down the paywall and um, maybe we continue with the membership, but we stop with the paywall or just go really hard paywall and change everything about who we are and just be like financial times level paywall because you know it doesn't work to drive subscriptions without having a really hard paywall. And the pandemic hit and we felt we have to take down the paywall for coronavirus content. Um, and so that really kind of forced our hand in sort of a good way. We took down the paywall. We still have the membership program. Um, we've had over the lifetime of the program, thousands of members. I don't even know off the top of my head, um, how many we have right now, but it hasn't contributed, uh, a meaningful, uh, amount of our revenue. And so right now it's just sort of on the side burner. And I think that actually what I would really like to do is relaunch it revamp it, but again, with no paywall as like a pure membership program contributions. Um, but yeah, so, so that's kind of our reader revenue journey. And again, I'm like the biggest reader revenue fan. So I wish it had worked better, but I do totally understand why it didn't. And I think coconuts just doesn't lend itself to a paywall. Um, so on the flip side, things are going really well with advertising, creative services, and premium documentary production. So we're really focusing on those. What's next? I'm excited in the the coconut moonshot idea. If money wasn't a thing or if time wasn't a thing or, you know, what's your big out there dream for coconuts? Gosh, it's hard to say. I would really like to, if money was no object, I would like to launch coconuts in a lot more cities. And we originally did want to do that. We wanted to launch in cities in India, We wanted to launch potentially in even um, Taiwan and Japan and Korea. Um, So that's probably one thing that I would do. I would also definitely ramp up our factual TV productions and do a full slate of those Um, and ideally get them all on places like Netflix, HBO Max, et cetera. Um, And yeah, really just become a a homegrown media empire across Asia Pacific. that's what I would like to do and then sell it for $50 billion. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Elon has some, has some spare change now. Since you're saying pie in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what's interesting is that 10 years in, you still think of yourself as a, as a city guide in some ways, you know, and yeah. here you think about those mm-hmm. expansion plans. And that, that's really interesting to me because you've, you've come so far in, in not just building city guides, but also building a TV business, you know, um, an OTT yeah. and events business, all that stuff, uh, a studio business. Like, so at the end of the day, if you had to grow, you still want to grow as a city guide in other cities? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. That's really the model. That hasn't changed, you know, in terms of what Coconuts is. We're local news and lifestyle for those cities. And so if you had to build that today in a, in a new city somewhere... Uh, what's yeah. that going to look like? Are you going to go in uh, with an acquisition or are you going to build it from scratch as you've always done? 
No, definitely. We would we would just launch a new city on coconuts and launch it ourselves, not acquire something. Uh, you know, we have our own style editorially. We have our own playbook as to when we launch in a city. We haven't done it in a while now. The last city we launched was Yangon in 2015. But we have the segments of content that we cover, news, food and drink, lifestyle, features, pretty straightforward. News is definitely the biggest and most important. Um, so it's a very expandable model. It's really just kind of about capital, I would say, to be able to launch in tons and tons of cities. But I'm also very interested in the acquisition roll-up model in addition to that. I think they can coexist. So another thing I would probably do if we had tons of funding is acquire all of our competitors across the region. And then I think you have a really good um, value proposition to advertisers, you know, Uh, because what often happens with advertisers is, like I said, BK was our competitor in Thailand. You talk to a media agency or an advertiser and say, yeah, yeah, we're going to do some campaigns with you and like five other publications. And so you're splitting that little segment of the revenue between five publications. And that's a tiny segment already because the rest are going to spend on something like Facebook and Google, most likely, and influencers, right? Who we all kind of compete with for advertising dollars. Yeah, this is a phenomenon, you know, like I said, that's happening a bit in this region. It's happening a lot in the U.S. where smaller publishers are getting bought by the bigger ones. With the duopoly, Facebook and Google dominating advertising so much, it's kind of like the little the little guys are banding up together and consolidating. So that's something I'm I'm very interested in as well. I'm curious about talent, Byron. How do you go yeah. about acquiring talent? What's your talent pipeline for the various parts of your business? And where's the greatest need? Sure. So that's a great question, and it is something that I I feel like we've gotten really better at, and I've learned a lot about is hiring. You know, we're pretty much constantly hiring, and it was probably a few years ago that I realized we're constantly going to be hiring forever, right? Um, people are leaving and developing, you know, um, making good hires. Uh, having them be effective is just a really key aspect of you achieving your objective ob- objectives, you know? So yeah, we have a full process. We use all the, I mean, nothing about it is rocket science, I don't think, but it's about having a really good process. I feel getting the word out amongst every possible platform that you can. So in Southeast Asia, things like tell them, uh, obviously LinkedIn, our own websites and social media. That's the first step really is when you have an open job, promoting the living heck out of it. Um, And then having a system of shortlisting candidates. I really like one thing we implemented a few years ago, which is screener calls, you know, get the quick details out of the way. So you're not beating around the bush um, and oftentimes finding out some sort of deal breaker at the end of the interview that you've had for an hour, you know, and that you think the candidate's great, then you find, oh, they can't start till next year and you need them next month. So, um, yeah, I think hiring is all about having a good process. And um, that's something that I feel we have put in place over the last few years and gotten better at. So what's the one thing that you look for in, in people that you hire? I know this is a very, I mean, it's a very diverse market uh, with with different levels of talent and people at different generations of of tech ability, right? Uh, what do you look for that, that tells you that this this is someone that you can take through multiple pivots as you as you build out the business? There's no one thing I look for, but there are a few things we we definitely look for in hires. One is, you know, just simply ambition and someone who has room to grow. Really, the person's attitude and their go-getting spirit is really important as opposed to, I don't want to say it's more important than their experience and them taking all those boxes, but um, it might make sense oftentimes to hire someone who's a little bit less experienced and who might be more cost effective, but who you get the sense that they're a real go-getter, they're very ambitious, and they're going to excel in this job. Um, Because one thing as well in terms of how we work that we've really put in place more and more over the last few years is that we don't want to micromanage people. And we have these departments, we have, you know, we delegate and we want people to have uh, ownership of what they do and be able to make decisions. So that's a really key aspect too. It's like, is this somebody who I'm just going to give instructions to all the time and they're going to carry them out? If 
by the book, but not really do much more than that. We much prefer someone who's creative, who's ambitious, who we can say, here's your objective, achieve it however you want. So that's something I really look for. Another thing is just really their ethos and their values. We have core values that we're pretty clear about. Um, They're believing in freedom of expression, believing in equality for people across racial, social, gender, et cetera, you know, uh, boundaries and caring about the environment. And we actually polled our um, staff uh, a few months ago and found, which I was really happy about and surprised that all of them agreed strongly with those core values. We did one of those, do you agree strongly with these? Do you agree a little bit? Do you disagree? Everyone agrees strongly with our core values. So I was like, nice, that's really, I'm somewhat surprised and it's a great sign that we're aligned in that way. So that's something I look for too, because someone who vehemently disagrees with those core values just won't gel well with our team and our mission. Tell us more about the team. You mentioned 50 people. Uh, What's a rough role breakdown? Are there business managers apart from the journalists? Are there product people? How does it break down? We have about 15 to 20 writers in the editorial team on the three publications. We have about... 15 to 20 in Grove and Grove is, I think we actually have more than that in Grove, um, maybe more like 20. And within Grove, we have salespeople, we have account managers who manage the campaigns and we have some creative people. And then in Coconuts TV, we have about five. And then we have some admin and support staff, including a technical lead. So that's one area that we don't have a lot of resources is product and tech. Um, and I really wish we did more, but we're focused more on revenue generating departments, not that product can't be that, you know, but so yeah, back to the pie in the sky question, which is a great one. If we pie in the sky, I'd have a huge tech team building the coolest website ever with the most beautiful design as well. It sounds like you've been on this really long journey <laughs> yeah. of ups and downs and all that, but tell us, you know, as you know, Splice is all about supporting media startups yeah. around the region. We want to be a um, yeah. a training school, if you will, for, for anyone who's who's trying to start a media business today, what is your best advice uh, for anyone starting out today uh, when it comes to building a business, funding it, uh, hiring people? It's a little bit of a cliche, but that they need to focus on the storytelling and the content as a media business above all. And that your business is probably going to live or die by the strength of your content. That comes first, and then the monetization and everything else comes later. The hiring, the firing, the 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 business. You got to have great content, and I don't think you can remotely succeed if you don't have great content. And you still might not succeed if you do have great content, <laughs> but you got to have great content to even have a chance at succeeding. I think. Have your definitions of success changed over time? Maybe a bit. I do think that in 2015, if you remember, things were quite frothy in media and there was very high valuations being thrown around. And, you know, certainly I was like, looked at those comparables and thought maybe that could be us too. Um, Since then, I think a lot has changed, you know, in the world and in in digital media. For us, success right now is being a profitable business. And we've been around for 10 years. Um, We're in these eight cities. We've built up a brand that is read by millions. I think for us to really get significantly bigger would require a large amount of investment, most likely, or some time. It's not going to happen overnight. So we're steadily but slowly moving that way. But so I think, yeah, maybe my definition of success has changed in that maybe five years ago, I thought, oh, we can just sell for millions and millions of dollars uh, if we have an audience as big as this other publisher. But now it's like a lot more incremental growth, a lot more focus on actually being profitable and sustainable. And um, yeah. Hey, that was wonderful. I'm going to wrap here. We're so happy about 10 years of coconuts. Yeah. You sound happy with your journey uh, and with where you've gotten. Yeah, thank you, Byron Perry. That's our buddy. Uh, That's a wrap for this episode of Splice Pink. If you like this podcast and you want to get more, please subscribe. Better yet, share this with someone. And get in touch. We're on splicemedia.com.